Thank you, George. I'd like to start actually with a land acknowledgement, acknowledging that we meet on Nanatuck land. We acknowledge as well the neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and the Pequot to the south, and the Abenaki to the north. And thank you for asking me to speak about Arthur. I, I first got to know about Arthur in 1998 when the newspaper ran a story about the new Renaissance Center that he had opened in the UMass, uh, as an affiliate of the UMass campus. And I remember very clearly the photo of him looking very proudly out the window of his new domain. And I got to know him there because a colleague was interested in doing something at our college to found a kind of independent research center uh, on a much smaller scale. And she suggested we go meet Arthur. And of course, I was intimidated to meet someone with, of such prestige and powerful personality. But I found him also to be extremely generous and extremely warm. And we've basically been friends ever since. So that's a friendship of more than 25, more than 20 years. And Arthur, as you can see, uh, was a person of great drive. He had the idea for the Renaissance Center, began working on it programmatically in 1967, but it took him three decades before he found a physical home in the very elegant estate and grounds of the Dakin House in the northern part of Amherst. He was the driving force between a lot of things in town, as I came to realize, because he had not just boundless energy, but boundless ideas. He was among the founders of the Amherst Club, which was founded in 1983, because the Rotary Club then refused to admit women, and the Amherst Club, still existing today, became a forum in which people from different walks of life in town could gather together for lunch, uh, enjoy sociability, and hear talks on important topics of cultural and intellectual and civic interest. Uh, there's a common theme here, I think, and that's that Arthur was a great scholar, but he was also passionately, equally dedicated to bringing knowledge to the people, to bring public and academy together. And it's not coincidental then that at the Renaissance Center, community members came, they gave presentations, they came to the audience to hear other people talk. It wasn't just an enclosed ivory tower for scholars on arcane subjects. And this brings me then to the Amherst Historical Society, because when Amherst, when Arthur was not founding an organization, he was uh, joining it and rising to leadership. And as George mentioned at the beginning, Arthur was a longtime board member of the society. He was a longtime president for the, of the society. And he let nothing stop him. In later life, when physical impairments kept him from driving, I would give him rides back and forth from his home to the meetings. And in the final years before the pandemic, we even took to meeting in his house because his input was so important. And we wanted to have him there. He, he, nothing, literally nothing could stop except death, unfortunately, could stop Arthur from his dedication and attendance at society meetings. He was as generous with his money as with his time. Numerous were the occasions when we were discussing some initiative and Arthur said, I can give you some money to fund that or I can bankroll that. I can give you some seed money. He always had his wallet out and he was a, a person of, of just a deep, deep generosity. But the generosity was not just financial, it was intellectual, it was personal. And so one of the greatest accomplishments, I think, was his role in spearheading the effort for the conservation and restoration of Emily Dickinson's famous white dress, which is the most celebrated and treasured of the many thousands of objects in our collection. And I can say now that Arthur was the anonymous donor who gave $5,000 of his own money to create a special custom made wooden and plexiglass display case so that the dress which we had in our collection since 1946 could be made available to the public as it still is and as you can still see it when the museum reopens. Uh, but there's a lot more to this story, and so in closing, I'd like to share it with you. Uh, in a lengthy letter of January 1905, uh, 2000, 1905, Freudian slip, <laughs> 2005, to the then president of the society, Arthur touched only on passing on this gift. Rather, he was talking about the larger, the larger logic and the larger agenda. He noted how, within a year or two of arriving in Amherst, some 34 years earlier, one of the first things he did was go to the Emily Dickinson house and how almost as soon after the, Emily, uh, the Eric Carle Museum and Yiddish Book Center opened, he went there to see what was new in town. By contrast, and here you'll see why I mentioned the Renaissance Center a minute ago, he says, it took me 20 years to think of stopping by the Strong House. Nothing had appeared about it, he means in the press. Nothing compelled me to go there. I suspect then that some of the recurring financial problems may be caused by the condition of the museum, the condition that is not seen as an essential part of Amherst's cultural landscape. Obviously, I think retaining and displaying Emily Dickinson's dress 
will go far to change all that, and in time, improve in a more lasting way the financial situation at the museum. And here is where he draws the analogy. He says, when I first was first given the Renaissance Center, where nothing had been before, I realized early on that consciousness raising, where the center would arouse, would seem interesting or even important to members of a community who hitherto had no interest in the Renaissance, I thought of ways to make the center as compelling as I could. And this really was his mission for the center, uh, for the society. According to our charter from 1903, we're supposed to be celebrating Amherst history, collecting its objects and papers, and engaging in programs that bring this heritage to the wider public, to the community. And so Arthur sets then out a very agen uh, ambitious agenda of things he wants to do over the next coming years. And he says, of course, it's not, doesn't have to be labor intensive or expensive. And that may not be actually true, but he thought about publications, about new exhibitions, about photography, about press reports and so forth. But probably the most important single thing he did was to come up with the idea of Founders Day, celebrating the anniversary of the town, Amherst becoming an official town, February 13, 1759, because what he wanted to do was to make this a local holiday so that we would literally be on everyone's calendar. And it would be a day when we'd think about Amherst history and also by means of the Conch Shell Award, named after the seashell that the colonists used to call people to meeting in the 18th century, we would also honor and thank those who've done much to preserve and share the history of the town of Amherst. I think it's really both sad and fitting that Arthur died on Christmas Day, a holiday he dearly, dearly loved. Many of us were the recipients of the elegant cards that he designed every year, combining each time a different work of Renaissance literature and Renaissance art. And I think it's therefore fitting that on this Founders Day, the first one without Arthur, we recall his role in creating the event, and we now therefore attach his name to the award that he conceived for this occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Arthur was a remarkable man. It would take a long time to even list all of his accomplishments and honors. Um, but thank you for that brief summary of his connection with the Historical Society and his vision for our future. Now, I, Anne Tweedy is going to introduce this year's Founders Day program. So we are so proud to present the 2022 Arthur F. Kinney Conchell Award to the family of Dudley Bridges Sr. Um, Dudley was born in Springfield, Mass, and moved to Amherst in 1948 after serving in the U.S. Army in World War II. Um, in Amherst, he was employed as by UMass as the Director of Building Operations, and he ultimately became the Director of Building Services. His civic engagement in the town includes being a co-founder of Amherst A Better Chance. Um, ABC is a national residential high school program that prepares students from underserved school districts for higher education and future leadership roles. Dudley Bridges also got the Westside Historic District along Snell Street listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, it was during Dudley's time as a trustee with our own Amherst Historical Society that he started the process of getting the five Civil War tablets once housed in the basement of Town Hall properly displayed. Dudley's family includes Christopher and Charles Thompson, members of the regiment that braved capture and worse to arrive in Texas in 1865 to let people know that the Civil War and slavery had ended. With us today accepting this award is Deborah Bridges, Dudley's daughter, and Anika Lopes, Dudley's granddaughter. William Harris, president and CEO of Space Center Houston is Dudley's nephew, and Edith Roberts Harris is the sister-in-law of Dudley and the daughter of Gil Roberts. We thank you so much for your family's ongoing contributions to Amherst. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the Amherst Historical Society for honoring my grandfather, uh, Dudley Bridges, for his efforts to, di uh, to daylight the Civil War tablets and find permanent home for them. So the significance that they represent can be learned, revisited, and celebrated as part of the very fabric of Amherst and beyond. Uh, they represent unmatched courage and sacrifice that led to my sitting here before you all today with my family as free human beings. Um, my grandfather was a humble giant. Uh, his good deeds were done in silence. 
Uh, he strove for results that honored Amherst history and uplifted future generations. He gave second chances to those who no one else would. And he preferred his recognition to be visible through the success of those that he helped and the causes he supported, and in this case, initiated. He took pride in the fact that our ancestors are represented on these tablets and was committed to sharing these stories, which we will continue to do one story at a time and one life-changing gift at a time through a nonprofit profit being created in their name called Ancestral Bridges. I would also like to thank the Civil War Tablet Committee uh, that this recognition and these efforts would not be possible without. And uh, lastly, I would also like to thank uh, Town Manager Paul Bachelman, who came in at a final hour and helped boo these tablets so they could serve as the nucleus for uh, last year's Juneteenth celebrations. Um, and with that, we'd like to share this with you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to hand it over to cousin William Harris. Thank you. Great, thank you, Anika, and thank you, Debbie. And I'm so humbled and honored to join all of you today. And Uncle Dudley would be so mad about getting this public recognition, but in his heart of hearts, he would absolutely be thrilled. Because as Anika described, he was the silent giant. He really believed that action spoke louder than words. And he was very committed to the community. He was committed to Amherst. And he was always committed to doing the right thing. And uh, he would give people more than two chances. He would give people three chances and four chances because in his heart of heart, he believed that everyone was good and could have a positive impact in the lives of others. Again, we're so thrilled by this recognition. Our committee has a long, our family has a long history in Amherst. And I think as many of you know, because you participated in the events of the inaugural Juneteenth celebration last year, while we held up our ancestors uh, of the Thompson family, uh, there really were some 300 residents of the Amherst region who were part of defending the union. And they're all represented on these important plaques. But it was historic that the 54th was the first African American regiment. And uh, even though the African American community in Amherst was fairly small, about 100 individuals, Thousands and thousands joined that regiment in defense of the Union in the hopes of a better life. And I think for the in case of our ancestors, hoping that their descendants would have better lives. I think we're a living testament that we do have better lives because of all of their sacrifices. Um, I shared last year at the ceremony that I was particularly moved now living in Houston to be in a community where my great, great, great grandfather uh, and his son and brother all went as part of Juneteenth in 1865 and spent five months there uh, informing former slaves that they were freed and also guarding Confederate soldiers. And our great, great, great uncle actually succumbed to diphtheria five days before he was to be discharged and returned to Amherst. So they, of course, made the ultimate sacrifice in support of hoping, their, again, their descendants would have a better life. We're particularly excited about being part of the effort to create a uh, historic walk in Amherst, uh, because Amherst is so rich in American history. To me, it's a microcosm of America and the journey of our country from the early days of Europeans arriving here, uh, the uh, conflicts that happened over the many years, and of course, uh, all the, the sacrifices that people made, all hoping for a better life. And so we really want to celebrate Amherst and the individuals who helped create the community that we all live in and we get to enjoy. I'm particularly proud of our ancestors um, who established Hazel Avenue and the Snell Street area and other parts of the community who are really dedicated. I, I have to recognize as well when hearing about uh, the work of, uh, or the, of course the very famous um, Emily Dickinson, um, one of our ancestors, Charles Thompson, who was actually um, Christopher's son, was a well-known fiddler and he used to play for parties at em Emily Dickinson's house and she's actually, documented it in some of her diaries that he was such a good fiddler you had to get up and dance. So it's wonderful to know that we have music in our genes, of course, manifested in our grandfather, Gil Roberts, who is commemorated on the historic mural. So again, we're so excited about moving forward and working closely with the Historic Society, Amherst Historical Society, and specifically Anne Tweedy and all of her great research uh, as we identify these important sites and see it as a way for people to come to Amherst and really embrace the important history and the role it's playing 
and the evolution of America. So thank you for having me here today. I'm so excited to be part of this conversation. And again, so humbled to be part of the celebration of Uncle Dudley. Thank you so much, William. Thank you. I wanted to also add, um, I urge people to take the tour for the plaques at the Bang Center because of the history they represent. Uh, this is a way to honor all the ancestors of Amherst who fought in the Civil War, including the 54th, the 55th, and the 5th Cavalry. Um, it's amazing to see family members who come there when I'm showing them the tablets, especially children, and they see their names. And it could be their three or four or five times great grandfather. And it's just the look on their face is you could see it all there. So I really urge people to really come in and then look at these plaques and look at the history. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And I guess, um, I don't know if anyone else from the family wanted to speak. Anika, did you have one more guest that wanted to come on or? I think we had a few people who had trouble uh, with the okay. link. I know, um, I believe Aniti had trouble with the link and um, I'm, I'm not sure there are probably a few others that weren't able to come on. Okay. So maybe we can open it up to question and answer. If you guys are comfortable, that might be great to start a dialogue. That would be wonderful. So we can accept questions and answers from the attendees, I believe. Cindy, do you know if we can? Yes, we can. You can either raise your hand and we can allow you to talk um, or you can type it in the Q&A box. Okay. Great. Deborah, what are the hours now for the Civil War tablet display? That's one question that I had. The hours are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday from 10 a.m. to 3.30 um, downstairs at the Bang Center. Excellent. And that display is ever changing in some ways. I mean, the tablets are there, but I think you're adding more to um, the gallery. Yes, I have. I research a lot, and and I have um, historical pictures um, that tell also tell the story about um, the soldiers, the commanders, mm -hmm. the fifty fourth. I have all historical pictures that. When I research and find new things, I change change it up all the time. So the exhibit is very exciting. That's excellent. So, I have a question. I, I'm just wondering, what are the um, main sources that you use to do your research? Is it family records or the Jones Library or what are the sources that you use? All of the, oh. Yeah, so there's kind of an interesting genesis to the story, and I think it's very um, uh, typical of American families where uh, my late brother and I, some 15 years ago, we had oral history about our, the background of our family, and a lot of it didn't make sense. And so we started to actually uh, do research, and he was a software engineer and designer, was very agile at doing digital research, and uh, that's actually how we started building our family pedigree chart. And in fact, some of our ancestors were lost to us. We had we have we didn't have the information it had not been passed down. And so uh, we did everything from the traditional uh, contacting city halls, getting copies of births and death certificates, marriage certificates. Um, and then probably one of the greatest resources of information was once we had uh, amassed enough information about our, our ancestors. My sister and I made two trips to the National Archive in Washington, DC. And if anyone has ancestors who served in the military, it, it was remarkably easy to, uh, to, to get their records. Uh, you 
can register and get a library card. It takes about 15 minutes. And then you watch an orientation video and then there's they're converting still from microfiche to digital. But um, we actually went through um, microfiche and identified the file numbers. And, and this was only like a good, maybe five or six years ago. And we actually pulled out uh, on a piece of paper, like the old index cards, and we wrote down the reference numbers and submitted them to the reference librarian. And within 45 minutes, I don't know where they came from, they pulled the original files and we went in the reference library and we were actually holding the original records. And how we learned a lot about the lives of these um, veterans and our ancestors was that um, they were technically volunteers uh, when they served in the 54th, 55th and 5th Cavalries. And once they were honorably discharged uh, after the war, they were eligible to receive a pension. But they had to prove that they were honorably discharged and were a sound character. And they made it actually quite hard for them to our benefit because they had to, they had to obtain, obtain uh, depositions about their character uh, with a lawyer. So you can imagine in you know, the 1870s that you had to somehow get an attorney, you had to pay that fee, you had to get others in the community to vouch that you were a sound mind and character, but we have all these narratives about them that were part of their files. And that's how we learned about their lives, their achievements. Um, and then they also did profiles about the people who wrote testimonials about them. And it's actually how I found the file of, of one of our, our ancestors who was part of the Fort, Fort Wagner assault. And it was his medical file from, and, and many of you know that they, they ended up sending many of the African-American soldiers ahead and it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. And he, they, it showed where he had been bayoneted in the battle, he survived that battle. Um, but we actually saw it was holding his actual medical record from the field hospital where they were documenting his wounds. So I, I thought it was remarkable that we could get access to original documents and see them. They allow you to photograph them. Um, they allow you to, they have a photocopier there to make copies. You're not allowed to bring in ink pens, you can bring in pencils. Um, but, but again, it was absolutely remarkable we could get access to these original documents. Um, in some cases, you can be really lucky and uh, find in a file the photograph of that person. Um, many soldiers knew because they knew a lot of people died in the Civil War. It was one of the bloodiest wars in history, and so they they didn't know if uh, they would know who the, what you know if the corp, who the corpse belonged to. You know, some soldiers pin their names inside of their clothing in case they were killed. And, but others had pictures taken and, and added to their files, their, their military files, so their bodies could be identified and returned to their families. Um, we did not find any photographs in those files, but uh, the ones that we looked at. But again, it was an incredibly rich source of information. Thank you so much for sharing that story. It's it, the richness to the whole story just keeps developing. Mm -hmm. I, I, again, I encourage anyone doing family research, uh, particularly if you have ancestors who served in the military to go to the National Archives in DC. It's, it's a really fun experience to be in that building and uh, right on Pennsylvania Avenue. And they have both volunteer genealogists and reference librarians who are experts and they, they were incredibly helpful to us in identifying information about our, our family members. Uh, there's another resource that we tapped into uh, the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture. They actually have a family research center and um, they have a uh, full time genealogist there as well. And as a free service, you can make an appointment and have a half hour to an hour appointment with them and they help direct you to resources and identify other digital resources and they'll actually assist you with doing some of that research on your families. And I see that we have five questions, I think, in the in the question, the Q and A. Okay, so I can read these off. Um, we have one question. What will the foundation ancestral bridges seek to accomplish?
So ancestral bridges will help to, will seek to rather uh, accomplish not only uh, continuing to daylight the uh, substance behind these tablets and as it pertains to the area, but also the, the, the rich culture and history of Amherst that is, you know, and has been invisible uh, for many parts. I mean, there, um, there's so there's music and arts and, and culture uh, that has, you know, been lost behind between the lines here. Um, I have one of my best friends even grew up near these areas and was unaware that these families lived there. And so, you know, we've had, for instance, we had a discovery that, you know, we found throughout our ancestors that I do wish uh, our Aunt Edie was here uh, to be able to share the story. But, you know, there was a time where uh, she was awarded a scholarship from the DAR and we were found that that was revoked, checked, canceled upon uh, learning that she was black. And so, one of the ways that we will do that is moving forward and ensuring that there are scholarships put in her name. You know, we will assist people from anywhere from connecting youth with, with internships that will impact their lives, home ownership, anything that we can do, giving gifts in these people's names that are really intertwined in this, this fabric of Amherst and really celebrating the freedom that they represented and the lives that they wanted us to live. Um, I recently shared a story of my mother here uh, while she was in the fourth grade at the Kellogg School. Uh, her teacher asked her during a history class, she said, you know, you're a little colored girl. What did it feel like to be a slave? And, you know, we have to reimagine what if that question had been, uh, how did it feel that your uh, four times, three times, sorry, my four times, three times great grandfather was a hero and was among the brave to put an end to slavery in America. Like what, what message does that send? And so we here at this time, we have the ability to change that projection for the youth. What does that say about who they are? What does that say to other children who are next to them? You know, so when you, that is that those steps break down our racial barriers. And so we will, do that and more of that in their honor. That's excellent. And it's also um, what Dudley had done with Amherst a better chance too. It's sort of like the next stage, which is awesome. There is a question. Um, what are the plans to display the tablets permanently? Well, we are actually working with, we have a, a civil war tablet committee uh, that we have established. I want to say this was uh, later 2019, or it's, it's been a blur basically when I came back to Amherst and we have just reconvened uh, meetings. So uh, we will definitely be updating folks um, in the near future. Um, this is something that will, I'm sure take a village, a village of, of input, um, but it will happen and we'll be happy to keep folks updated as we go along and um, you know, happy to connect with people who want to stay informed and may want to be of assistance. Thank you. There's a question for Deborah. Deborah, could you say a little bit more about the 54th Regiment and Amherst? Uh, the 54th, there are uh, a few relatives that were in Amherst, but I believe that uh, William could probably answer that question yes. a little bit better than I could. Yes, and in fact, I know watching today, we have Robert Rummer, who has been an incredible resource to us and our family and helping learn about our, our history. And in fact, he was one of the first people I contacted. Uh, uh, and of course, he has now published uh, several books about the history of African-Americans and other important people from Amherst uh, in, the, in the Civil War era. But we know that at the time of the, the Civil War, there were about 100 African-Americans, most of them are his ancestors living in, in the Amherst region. And um, again, it was uh, decided to begin to allow African-Americans to serve uh, on behalf of the Union, but there was a lot of anxiety. Um, there was a concern about uh, were these people, 
would, would these African Americans be good soldiers? Would they be capable? And in fact, most of them had to practice with sticks. They would not actually give them arms until they went into battle. And so they were at a huge disadvantage, but proved that they were really valiant. They were committed to the union and this cause. And actually, um, African Americans and, and slaves, free, both freed and uh, enslaved, flocked to join the 54th. And then that caused the creation of other units across the country that uh, enabled African Americans to organize and, and former slaves to be part of it. We have another branch of our family, I'll share, Robert's side. So um, our ancestors, Thompson, are on um, the Robert side of the family, but up the maternal line, um, up the Bakeman line. Um, and then on the Robert side of the family, we're actually descended from slaves from Eastern Shore, Maryland, um, who were slaves on the Wiley Plantation and owned by the Lord family. And the Lord supported the, um, the union and said to any of their male slaves, if you will join um, the, the cause of the union, you have your freedom. And so our great, great, great grandfather, uh, Perry Roberts was uh, one of those. He was part of a group that, that are known as the, um, the Unionville 18. They were 18 men who fought for uh, the, the Union and afterwards returned to Eastern Shore, Maryland. Uh, his son decided he wanted to have nothing to do with staying in Eastern Shore and left for Amherst. <laughs> and that's actually how um, Perry Roberts came to live with several of his siblings in, in Amherst and built his own home on Hazel Avenue as one of the first houses. And so that's kind of part of the, the genesis of the family, how we ended up with many of our ancestors living on Hazel Avenue. That's cool. Did, um, Anika, did you want to invite um, someone else to join Robert Romer? Yes. He wanted to speak. So Cindy, can we um, get Robert Romer on as a presenter? I think Cindy's working at the North Amherst Library, so maybe somebody's okay. called her away. For... Oh, no. <laughs> so I don't know if we can text her or, or just wait for her. Um, yeah, why don't you skip to the next question and then... So we have a couple of... Um, let's see. We have a couple of messages to you guys. Carly Tartikoff said that Gary and I are here and want you to know how proud we are to celebrate this with you today. Thank you for your contributions to us and to the town of Amherst. Um, and thank you to them, both Gary and Carla Tartikoff are part of the Civil War Tablet Committee, along with Amokar and Demetra Shabazz and Jennifer Moisson, Benjamin Breger, uh, and David Zomak. They're all part of that committee, so thank you all. And then there's just general well wishes um, and great thanks from a number of folks was watching. Um, are there any other questions that folks and have? And if I, if I can make a question, I just again mm -hmm. want to say what a great experience it was for all the Juneteenth festivities last summer in such a hard time. It was just so much fun to see people out and to have people learning about Juneteenth and to see the ceremonies and the reenactors. It was just great. And I really appreciate all the effort it took to put all that together. And I wondered if something is going to be planned for next for this coming summer, or if you have any news to share about that. <laughs> well, we are, we're planning um, a historic walking tour. Um, and actually, we're going to go walk it on Monday to make sure that it makes sense. Um, but it's going to be fantastic and share lots of stories um, of these neighborhoods that I don't think people really realize how historic and valuable and interesting they are. Um, and I think we're hoping to do that for one day. Because June, Juneteenth is now a federal holiday 
right. everyone's going to have Monday off. So we're trying to time it so that one day could be historic tours. Um, I think there's going to be uh, Peter Brace Brigade, who was around last year, yeah. is coming back. And so we might have an opportunity to have them at the History Museum um, doing a camp out. Um, but maybe, Anika, you can talk to more of the broader sense. I think it's going to be like last year, but more parts involved and, and more folks involved. Uh, definitely more folks involved. <laughs> And, uh, you know, this is forming into a, a weekend event, um, which would also include, as we know now, uh, both the folks up at the Mill District and also the Drake. Um, but again, this is in very premature stages, so we will uh, keep everyone updated. That's terrific. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Do any of our panelists have any more questions? I just want to say that the, the comments in the chat are building up and I hope you get to read all of them. They're yeah. all very, very appreciative. And I know you're trying to focus on the screen and, the, <laughs> and answering the questions, but um, you have a lot of admirers uh, mm -hmm. showing their appreciation in the comments. So if you click on the Q&A, you'll see them. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you guys. I don't know if Cindy is with us to put Rob Robert Rummer on. Um, we could wait a little bit or how is everyone feeling about that? If, if Robert could join us, it would be fantastic because yeah. he's such an incredible resource and uh, it, it's uh, his love of Amherst, of course, and the documentation and and you know his most recent book about a young man who left Amherst College to fight for the side of the Union and was driven to help end slavery was his motivation. And it uh, of course relates to the Snell family, and of course you know Snell House and Snell Street. Um, and it's a it's a wonderful book, uh, and I encourage you all to to obtain copies of it. But I know Robert has also written a book about the history of African American families and and the Western. Part of the state and uh so i'm sorry he's not able to to, to he usually too he makes sure that I, he keeps me correct and the things that i say in research uh because he of course has become quite the historian himself we can try to text cindy or yeah. give her a call Could she maybe okay. give you uh permission could she maybe make you host yeah i don't know I think I can only share screen. I don't think I can admit people. Does anyone happen to have Cindy's um, cell phone number? <laughs> I, I just tried to call the library and <laughs> nobody's picking up. <laughs> oh dear. Sorry, I'm back. Oh, here she oh, is. She's she's back. We have hey, a chance. Could you admit Robert Romer? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Thank Sorry, you so much. There was an emergency in the basement. Oh no. So sorry about that, everybody. That's okay. Hi, Robert. Welcome. Hi. Can you Hi. guys can you guys hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Good to see William. Other members of what I regard as the Harris branch of my family. Yes. Great to see you, Bob. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> 
so I think there were some questions before that we were hoping that you could share some of your knowledge on um, the connections of the family and your research. William, did you have a specific question that you wanted to ask Bob? Yes, I was going to ask Bob if you could share a little more about um, kind of the origins and growth of the 54th Regiment and ultimately then the 55th and 5th Cavalry. Uh, I mean, I think, I think we know the 54th was the first of the African American, formally sanctioned African American units. I mean, Blacks and other African Americans were joining the, the war effort for the Union informally. And, and um, but this was, I think, the first recognized African American unit. Yeah, I'm not quite sure about that, but it was certainly one of the very first. And as you know, William, you had. Uh, ancestors in the Massachusetts 54. Sometimes people thinking about black soldiers in the Civil War are surprised to learn that it wasn't only the 54. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, I think I said this at the Juneteenth ceremony, a number that I wish every high school student would learn, 200,000, 200,000 black men fought for the Union. And wow. So it's a, a lot, lot bigger than the 54th. There was something like 10 Amherst men in the 54th, and then a dozen in the Mass 5th Cavalry, which was formed later. So there was one of my, I think of as my Thompson ancestors, of course he's William's ancestor officially, but there was one of the many Thompsons from Amherst who fought in the Union who was in the 54th and um, four more Thompsons, um, Christopher, Christopher's son, Charles, uh, John, and one more whose name escapes me, but five Thompsons altogether. <laughs> and I think many of you know that I took advantage of being on the Historical Commission a few years ago to persuade the town as an official town act to erect a belated gravestone for Christopher in West Cemetery. We know he was died there, but he was probably too broke for his family to afford a stone at the time he died. And we made a gravestone that uh, was a gravestone he would have had if he had gotten one back in 1898 when he died. And we listed on the backside all the Thompsons who fought for the Union. And we meant it to be uh, implicitly a recognition of the many, many Amherst men who fought for the Union. Uh, that's how. Uh, well, it was before that that I got to meet the, the Harris family. Steve Connor, the veterans agent, and I organized the ceremony in 2011 um, for the Black Civil War soldiers from the town. I expect quite a few of you were at that ceremony. And uh, that's where I first met William and Edie and Oh, Lori wasn't there, uh, but Dan was there. Yeah, Dan was there, yes. So in, in I, uh, perhaps it's unseemly of me to be plugging my book, but uh, <laughs> I, I took advantage of uh, publishing a book which had nothing to do directly with the Amherst 54th or the 5th Cavalry, but I, um, it's a short book. It's 50 pages of text and then 100 pages of notes and appendices, um, which may be the, I don't know, some of my physics friends have always referred to me as footnote happy, but I, I put in as an appendix, my best estimate of who the 22 black soldiers total from Amherst were and how I, came to that conclusion. And I also a list of the I think, 23 white Amherst college students who 
like the main subject of my new book, became officers in black of black regiments, which is a basically unknown sidelight to Amherst College history. I also included some appendices like I listed the Amherst College students that I know of who I could find who became soldiers for the Confederates. Um, and anyhow, um, it's been great fun and interesting during the 20, Ooh, 21 years since I officially retired from being a physicist, although I've kept at some of that, uh, learning about new things this way and meeting a lot of people I wouldn't otherwise met. So I, I really appreciate being part of the, uh, well, the, call it the Amherst history community, even though I've all I do for the Historical Society is, is my wife and I give money. And I also have given quite a few talks there, history <laughs> bites and whatnot. Anyhow, thanks for inviting me on. Oh yeah, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. So I think we are now at 3.15. Um, I think we were just supposed to go to three. Are there any other questions or does anyone want to announce anything or? Well, let's see. Um, I mean, I just hope that um, the Historical Society Board will um, keep learning about the activities that you're planning and please keep in close touch with us and let us know if there are ways that we can get your message out and get information out. Um, this is really impressive what your family has done and what you've learned. And uh, we, I hope we can promote it in multiple ways. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I do wanna say one final thought if I may. And I think it is so important to understand these historic, the history and understand how decisions were made. Uh, but I think it's also important to acknowledge we do live in contemporary times and we need to take away those lessons and our aspiration in all of this and this understanding is that our, you know, our family and many other families care deeply for the community. And so all these efforts are to create a more harmonious community and one that continues to improve society and make it a better place. And so it's not to pass judgment for, about people in the context of their time as much to understand the dynamics of what happened and what are those residual elements that might be affecting how we perceive others and how we conduct ourselves today. So I think, you know, awareness and knowledge is really important, a powerful way of helping us uh, formulate how we want to conduct ourselves now and into the future. Mm -hmm. So that really is a, a lot of what drives me is uh, taking away those lessons and understanding that we can make decisions today that are really going to benefit the entire community and make it a, a, an even better place than it is currently. Well said. Excellent thank words. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. George, do you have any final announcements or statements? Do you want to officially close the meeting? Or first, I have to unmute. Um, <laughs> uh, this has been wonderful hearing these stories, and. Um, I stand with Gigi. We want to hear the stories of Black people in Amherst. Um, you're all, we are all part of the same community and we all have our stories to tell. Um, this particular presentation has been recorded and an edited version, perhaps leaving out the parts where we're waiting for Cindy to come back online. Um, <laughs> Amherst Media is interested in doing a cable cast. Um, Amherst History is interested in linking to this. So these stories, um, your stories will be told to the larger community. So we thank you very much for coming on today. And I hope this is the beginning of um, a very fruitful partnership with you. So that's, okay. thank you, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so we'll see you all soon. Soon, soon very soon. <laughs> Come back next year for a progress report at the next Founders Day. <laughs> Great. Okay. And thank you, William. Bye -bye.